Well, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome all of our locations. And if you're watching online or uh, up in the hills camping and you're catching us, great. We're so glad that you've joined us. I'm going to be kind of walking you through uh, something that God's been doing in my life over the last three years. Um, just to give you a little background into it, uh, I am not great at taking breaks. Uh, I really love to go, 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 go. Uh, if I don't feel like I'm accomplishing something, sometimes that just kind of defeats just my morale, all that kind of stuff. So, and I, I, I know I'm not alone. Most of us uh, probably go, yep, uh-huh, yeah, I totally relate. And so what God's been working on me uh, is kind of where we got the idea of this sermon is kind of this whole phrase, Godspeed. Because typically when you hear that, somebody's like, and Godspeed be with you, you know. It's kind of this, hey, I know you're maybe going through a hectic time, but I hope it goes efficiently. I hope it goes quickly. It goes this. I, I hope it goes well. But it kind of has this connotation. It's fast. Um, but if we were to really dive into that word and break it apart, I actually think that's probably the wrong mindset with it. Not saying that God doesn't love efficiency. God doesn't like maximizing things. But if we were to actually be at God's pace, God's speed, it would probably be a walk. And some of us already got annoyed. It's like, why don't we run? Um, and, and if you look at it throughout Scripture, especially pay attention, when Jesus was here, there were so many times we were just like the disciples. Hey, Jesus, we need to get to here. Jesus, we need to go here. We need to go this. And he'd be like, no, we're not. I'm not going to do this right now. Or he'd, they'd be like, hey, we need to heal this. We need to heal that situation. He's like, actually, no, I'm going to go um, kind of sit off and, and just spend time with the Father. And they're like, now? Like, this doesn't seem like the best time. Or when they're on the boat, crazy storm, and he's asleep. And they're like, how are you asleep? Like, it's just these moments over and over again to where you see just Jesus being at a different pace. And so I wonder, because if we were to kind of just look at us, uh, studies would show this, we are constantly at a low-grade exhaustion. And all of us probably went, amen, but I'm not going to say it out loud. Um, because even now, like, times are, we're changing into a different season. School's about ready. I mean, it's in force. It's going. But also on that, youth activities is, is back in force. And you have work. People are getting back from vacations. Now we're going to hit the ground running. Like, we feel all of that right now. And then it's going to go all the way till we hit Thanksgiving or Christmas. All right? And so we feel this rhythm. And so if I were to ask any of you, uh, now some of you might be the outliers, but if I were to, hey, how's it going? Your answer is, I am busy. Busy this, busy with that, busy, busy, busy. And so we stay in this kind of low-grade exhaustion. And I think God's going, that's not the speed I want you to go at. Because then you wonder why we're not doing well. Just emotionally, spiritually, mentally, all those things. And so God's been getting on me because I'm right there with you. I struggled with this myself. And if there's a picture I want you to think of, think of God taking us on a beautiful hike out here in the Black Hills, and we are the kids running as fast as we can ahead of him and going, ooh, 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 and getting way, way ahead. And he's like, hey, so-and-so, get back here. I need you to stay with me. It's... We, God's going to sound like the parent at Disneyland or the parent, you know, like at the park. Just get back here. Please stay with me. Please stay with me. Please stay with me. And so part of that is because he's going, you're going to miss things if you keep running so far ahead of me. And on top of that, you're going to get lost. You're going to get confused. And so I want us to sit in something that God taught us many, many years ago, but it's this whole practice it's a discipline, but it's called like taking the Sabbath, learning to rest with the Lord. So Exodus uh, says this. Here's where we get that idea of Sabbath from. Exodus 20, 8 through 11. This is one of the Ten Commandments. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest, dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household made do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. This is one of the teachings I feel like, especially in the American church, we go, yes, we know that. 
I'll see if I get to it, okay? Because it's one of those things like, yes, we know. We know we should take a rest. Science tells us this. We should rest. We should do all these things. And we don't do a good job at it. I mean, even for me, growing up in the church, I heard this teaching. And when I was a young kid, when I heard, okay, 24 hours of doing nothing, I wanted to scream, boring. Like, what? No. I don't want to do that. I want to go do something. I want to have fun. Like, why do we need to spend 24 hours literally just doing nothing? And then you'd hear of some pastors correlated to like, hey, the Sabbath is going to be like heaven. That made me more scared because I'm like, that sounds like a forever of nothing. So why am I wanting that? Like, that's not what I want at all. And so I struggled with this, like big time of just going like, I don't understand the concept. I don't understand why we need this break. I understand rest. We need sleep. I understand some of these things, but it feels like there should be more to it and more weight to it. And so God in his wisdom led me to some of these places. So Sabbath, if we were to look up the word, it means Shabbat, and it means to stop and rest. But here's the part. We typically know that, but it also means this, to delight and worship. So adding those four components in is vital. Because I want you to catch this. God created this because this is a rhythm he wanted us to be a part of. To where you go, you work these six days. And these six days, Satan's going to try to throw things at you. Work's going to try to. Family, it's going to be crazy. Some weeks it's going to be great. But you need this seventh day just to take a breath and go, okay, God, help me to refuel. Help me to get back to where I need to be and not be constantly exhausted. So then you got to think, this idea, yes, it's a commandment uh, from Exodus, but recognize G- God gave this as a rhythm for himself. He set the example in this. Go back to Genesis 2, 2 through 3. It says this, on the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. If there was a person, a being, who didn't need rest, can we say that God would be that person? God would be that being. And so, if he's creating this rhythm, I think it's very important for us to pay attention to it. And we know this. But here's something I just found out that I thought was like, interesting. Uh, a lot of the other time components that we have are connected to space. So like, a day is the rotation of the earth. The month is connected to the lunar cycle or the moon and all those kind of things. And then, you have a year which is connected to the earth's orbit around the sun. Week doesn't have any of that. If you wonder where we get week from, it's from God to where he goes seven days. That's your week. Now, what's crazy, humans being humans, there was a time during the French Revolution where there was a group that said, you know what, let's try something different. They did a 10-day week. I thought, I was like, okay, wonder how that went. It was terrible. Like, it was absolutely awful. They thought productivity would go up, plummeted. Mental health went the wrong direction. They had more suicides happening during this time. So you can just see God's going, I'm telling you, you can try to do whatever weeks you want to do, but the seven-day week is the rhythm that you need in your life. So let's look at these four components. Let's break them down a little bit more. Four components of Sabbath. Stop, rest, delight, and worship. So this first one. We'll start with stop. And I do think this has a little bit of order to it. Because for you to rest and then delight and worship, the first thing you got to do is stop. Um, but especially in American culture, we don't do this well. And with the inv- inventions that have happened, it makes it worse for us. Uh, you think about electricity. Now we have lights that can keep us up late in the night. Think about our phones that do this. Prior to all of this, do you realize that most adults got 10 to 11 hours of sleep per night? There you go. Now, there was some of the reaction. The 8 o'clock was like, okay, cool, whatever, you know. Um, We are down now to the average adult gets six. And I I think we got to look at this and go, God did not create us to be robots. We need our rest. We need to stop. But the danger is we just go, but there's all these things I need to do. Or you get distracted and you're like, what time is it? How did I spend three hours on this? Or scrolling, I mean, let's be honest. Um, 
And we're like, why, why am I staying up? Why you, we got all these things. But it's just this constant, like, I think in our culture we're going, I need more, I need this, I need that, or I feel like I'm missing out, and we just struggle to stop. Now, Jesus taught on this too. This is not just like Old Testament teaching. Jesus focused on this. Look at this in Mark. 27 through 28, then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. I want to sit in this passage a little bit because I know it's short, but it has got some power behind it because at this time, Jesus is talking to a culture, Jewish culture, that if we were going to put Sabbath on a a pendulum, like we're over here kind of going, ah, we'll get to it when we need it. Now, Jewish culture is over here like, you better do it. And here's all the rules to it. So hence why you see in the New Testament, Jesus constantly having to combat some of the rules that were actually not helping the Sabbath be the Sabbath. Because you see that second part that he has on here. He said, and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. He goes, that's not what the design was for. It was so that you could stop, take it in, and it would actually be a blessing to you. So when Jesus would heal on the Sabbath, the Pharisees were like, you can't heal on the Sabbath because that's work. And he's like, stop it. This is helping somebody. This is going to be so meaningful to them. Like you're missing the point. And they're getting mad at Jesus right here and his disciples because they're choosing to eat on this day. And you see it throughout Scripture, him debating with the Pharisees, because they had it swung so far over here. But I think for us, especially today, we need to hear that first part of it. I'll say it again. The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people. So here's the challenging question. Are you stopping and having your needs met because of the Sabbath? Do you stop well? Do you take that time and let God heal those things? Because, man, let me tell you, six days can sometimes be, man, that was tough. Or it can be good, but at the same day, you're still feeling this emptiness. You're still feeling this, like, why do I not feel fulfilled right now? Why do my relationships feel stuck? Why does this all this? And we just keep going, keep going, keep going. And God's like, can you please stop? Because you need this rhythm in your life. So here's the ultimate part of stop. Stop so we can stay in rhythm. We are designed to be in rhythm, be in step with the Lord, and if we don't stop, we'll miss it. So there's stop. Now let's go into rest. Now some of these can feel like they're overlapping, but I think they all have different components to it. So stop now, and then you rest. Now rest is going to fight this that goes on, and it's called the wheel of suffering. So you've got two components here that happen. These wheels that just keep spinning in our lives, and they're not helpful. So this first one over here is aversion. Aversion is that moment to where you are fearful, you're scared, or you don't want to do something, although it's the right thing to do. Give you an example. Fear of having the tough conversation. Fear of forgiving somebody. You know it's the right thing to do, but you're like, "Mm mm-mm, too hard, I'm out. So what you do is you avert it and you create more problems. And so it just keeps spinning. And God's going to keep going like, we need to deal with this, so you need to deal with this. Stop trying to avoid it. The other side of it is craving to where we experience something and then we want more of it and more of it and more of it and more of it. And we keep consuming more and more and more. And to the point to where we're just never satisfied. Do you see how both can get you stuck? One is going one direction, like, I just need more. The other one's going, how can I avoid all of this? Both create this wheel of suffering. Now, going back to scriptures, here's what I want you to see. The Bible talks about this to where it says, okay, learn to stop, but now you also got to learn to rest. So take a look at this. We'll go back to the stop kind of passage here in Exodus. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. So Moses says this to the Israelite nation as they're going, hey, let's stop. Let's make sure we take the seventh. He says, talks about the Sabbath again in Deuteronomy, but a whole different context. Look at this in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt. But the Lord your God brought you out with his strong hand and powerful arm. 
That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. Two different kinds of commands here. Still, you got to observe the Sabbath, but here's what I want you to catch. What Moses is trying to teach him, hey, remember when you were in slavery, because that was a suffering that was not awesome. And it felt like a version because they kept wanting to stop doing all the work that the Egyptians wanted to do, but they didn't have an option. They were oppressed. They were told, if you don't do this, we're going to whip you or we're going to do these things. They were in slavery. It was miserable. And so Moses, remember, remember that. But then on the other side, he's also teaching because Israel is about ready to gain their freedom. They're out of slavery. And he goes, now remember what the Egyptians were like. They constantly wanted more. They were always building things, always trying to make you do clothes, do whatever. All the supplies and things, all the, everything they want, they put it on the backs of other people. So you could see them craving. They wanted the next city. They wanted the next thing. So if we were to take, you got the Israelites and what they're walking through and the Egyptians what they're walking through. If you were going to say, where's America today? We are the top consumers of everything. We consume so much. And we want so much more at lower prices and all those kind of things. And so sometimes we will. We send all of our goods out to other companies to put them and other countries to put them together and then send it back to us. You see companies doing that. And so you see this, like, throughout Scripture, Egypt is an example of, like, what the Babylonian Empire and what this. But these empires that would just crave more and more and more, and it wasn't like it was helping them. It was actually causing this strife in their own country to where it's like, we're never satisfied. And I think if we're honest, that's where we are. And so here's what rest does. It teaches us to resist. We could have these things in front of us. We, should, we could crave them, but we have to learn to say no. Think about this. Over a period of time now, We've had inventions that actually would be time savers. And you would have thought, okay, now we can rest. We don't have anything. I mean, back in the 60s, when they are creating dishwashers, ovens, those moments that you're like, oh, man, look at all the time we're going to save now. And then you get the washing machine and the dryer. And, I mean, all these inventions. And they're going, man, people now are only going to work 20 to 30 hours a week, and it will be great, and they'll have all this leisure time. And here we are now. We don't work 20, 30 hours. I'll tell you that. What do we do? We took England. Okay, great. I can do more. I can do more. I can do more. And that's what we keep doing. We keep filling it with the next thing. And that's the danger in this is to where we actually don't know how to rest because we don't know how to resist it. And we don't recognize we're actually creating this wheel of suffering behind the scenes. And so back in the day, when grocery stores were closed, the restaurants were closed on Sundays. I mean, we wanted them back open because we're like, well, I need to eat. I mean, how would I do that? Um, I need to do this. Like, I, I need clothes. So that's, that's how it works. And here, I, I think we had like, yeah, it just works out. And, and companies are going to go, well, if we're going to make money, let's open. And then look what we created. Or we never stop. And so we can blame culture all we want, but at some point, we got to look at our own hearts and go, how am I going to rest and resist the need to go buy things or be occupied by time, whether it's on my phone or whatever? You have to resist. And on the other side, resist the aversion part of it of just going, well, I'm just not going to deal with it. Because that keeps you from being able to experience what I think God wants you to experience in Sabbath. So both parts are true because ultimately, here's the next part of it. God wants you to delight. And it's really hard to delight if you can't rest. You can't take a moment and just go, man, where I'm at, it is just good. Uh, John 15, 11, these are some of the last words Jesus had to his disciples. He said this, I've told you these things that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. When it comes to delight and joy, be curious. I mean, if we were going to take a poll of just our community, would they label Christians full of joy? Would they label Christians full of delight? Sadly, I don't think we'd get that answer the way we think it should go. And I think ultimately the way God would want it to go. 
Because if you look at joy, joy is such an important factor in our lives. God teaches over and over to have joy regardless of the circumstances. So here's the crazy part. When you study it in the Bible, it comes to joy, it's a verb and a noun. It's both things. Joy is a feeling. It's that like, happiness feeling. That moment that you get to sit and maybe, I mean, marketing is great at this. You get to see at the beach and you're like, oh. Give me my drink, give me my, this, let's just take it in right now. You know, like that's, that's what they're marketing. That, I mean, they are trying to sell you a Sabbath. Just think about that for a little bit. All vacation companies selling you a Sabbath. And they know it because you crave it down deep. And then we have that feeling and it's great, but it's got to get deeper than that. Joy is not just a feeling, it's a condition. Now we move it more into that noun component where it's a character trait. We go, man, we have that. And God goes, yes, and I want you to be able to sustain that. So regardless of the circumstances, you become a person. They go, man, you're always joyful. You're always full of delight. And I understand some personalities are different than this, but there is something in our hearts that go, you know what, where my life is at, what I get to experience, God is good. And I understand we go through some good, tough times, but we could still learn to have joy regardless. And then the last one is joy becomes a discipline. We learn how to put it in front of us. We learn how to go, okay, how do I make sure joy stays at the forefront? And so some of the ways we do that, we have to take a Sabbath to where we learn to delight in what God's given us. So here, I give you a few activities so you can work on joy. You ready? This will be fun. Feasting. I just gave you permission, okay? On a day, like maybe take Sunday or Saturday, whatever your day's off, feast, Okay? Put something in the smoker, like let's go, let's have a delicious meal and enjoy it because God gave you the ability to make that food, enjoy that food, even if you want to go out to eat and be like, man, how they make that cheesecake, fantastic, all right? Like that's what I'm telling you. God goes, take delight in this, enjoy it. I've created all these things. I've even given you the ability to create things, delight in it. But then on top of it, have time with community and family. Spend time with those people that you love. And now, hear me, we've got to work on, hey, we've got to make that time together. One of the better things I remember growing up is like, after we get done with church, you know what my family would do growing up? And we don't do this as much anymore. Go out to eat. And go out to eat with some family in the church or go out to eat as a family and just go, let's sit, let's enjoy this together. And so those are parts of it to where you learn just to have a meal together, where you learn how to have these things and you're just like, man, this is good. I need this in my life. On top of that, gratitude. I think on, a, on the Sabbath, one of the things you need to practice is what are you thankful for? Do that at least one day a week. I would encourage you to do it more, but at least one day a week to where you're pausing and going, you know what, here's the things I'm thankful for because this will actually help you see the joy that you do have in your life. And then on top of that, play. This was a big one for me because for so long, like I told you before, like, when it said do nothing, I was like, well, all right, God, I'm sitting here. When are you going to show up? Like, doing nothing, sitting on the couch, bored out of my mind, um, doing the Sabbath. Um, <laughs> just love how I interact with God. Yeah. Don't say it out loud, but thoughts going on. Um, but then God like, spoke to me one day, and I remember a pastor saying this, and he's like, this is it. He's like, hey, you can just play with God. And I was like, wait, hold on. What do you mean by that? And he's like, the things you love to do. I, and, and moving here, one of the things I learned was snowboarding because in Kansas, where I grew up, there was no snowboarding. <laughs> you tried and it'd just be miserable. Um, so being able to do that. So I got to a point, he's like, you're right. I could just go have a day to where I could go do the things that I love. And the father who created me is going, I love watching you do that. Every parent in the room gets this. When you watch your kids play and it's going well, they're not fighting, let's be honest. Um, and they're just playing. I mean, I've seen my kids just being creative or this. And there's just this like pride that kind of wells up in you. And they're just going, man, I'm happy for them. God goes, that's me. And you are all my children. And I just want to see you play sometimes and see a smile come to your face and see you enjoy the gifts that I give you, the abilities that I've given you. So yes, I gave you permission. Go fishing. Go golfing. Go do it. Read a book. I don't care what it is, but go play. And here's my only caveat. Maybe just do it you and God. And while you're doing these things, just, I know for me, 
I would have headphones in listening into worship music or just have them off and just enjoy the mountain. That is what it looks like to take a Sabbath too. And that opened up my mind. I was like, oh, yes, God, I love that. Some of it may go see a movie, but just play so that you can have delight and God going, I created that. I gave you that. I want you to do that. And then we live in a beautiful age, area, nature. Go take hikes. Go experience it. Some of you are like, absolutely. Others are like, okay, it takes me a little bit. Um, and then the last one on there, I put it on there. Yes, I did. Um, make love to your spouse. Now, obviously, not everybody's married, but to those of you who are married, there you go. I give you permission. Uh, <laughs> not that you needed it, but there you go. But here's why. Now, this is not Todd coming up with this. This was Jewish practice. Their mindset was, hey, on a day like this, go enjoy those things together, especially as a married couple. Go enjoy that. And so that's this mindset. God's going, Sabbath is not just sitting and waiting for God to talk to you. He's going, go take delight in this. I will talk to you throughout the whole day. I will talk to you when you're playing. I'll talk to you when you're enjoying nature. I'll talk to you through all of this. Enjoy it with the people I've created for you and for you to have relationships with. Enjoy it. And so I think sometimes we are not attentional enough in this area. We desire it so badly. And we try to fill it in. What we do instead of having a rhythm for it, we go, let's just pack it all in in a week on a vacation. And God goes, yes, take vacation, but do that more on a regular basis, weekly basis. Do we have that time together? So here's delight. So delight so we can choose joy. Be intentional with this. Sabbath in a way that you're like, man, this is the day I look forward to. This is the day because it brings me joy. Now, I understand. Sometimes you'll try things and it backfires. But that doesn't mean you give up. Okay? You can go like I've had, go snowboarding and you fall flat on your face and hurt something. You're like, well, that day didn't go exactly how I wanted it to. But that doesn't mean you stop the rhythm. Now, this last one, worship. Now, I could get in this and... Um, End it here, but it would feel like you could do all this with self-care. This could just be like, here's how to have mental health. This is the part of it that I go becomes the critical piece because the reason God created Sabbath is yes, sir, you to be healthy, but also for you to connect with him, to have a real relationship with him. Yes, you should be doing your devotions, but there should be a day where you go, I dedicate this time to you, just like you do in all other relationships. A marriage that designates time together, a family that designates time together, those are important and valuable, and it usually works out when they do that. God wants the same thing. So this is where we get to worship him and connect with our true creator, our savior, our king. That's why we do on Sundays, we have these days where we worship together, corporately. But it also has got to be done on an individual level. So that's why we want you. As a church, we're not going to apologize. We think you need to be in church because you need these moments. And whether it's Sunday, Tuesday, whatever day works that is your Sabbath, you go, I need this worship time together because God, and I need to connect with him. And it's really hard to connect with him if you don't make time and you're constantly at a low-grade exhaustion. Because some of you can come to church and just be like, okay, we're here. We made it. Check it off the box. Let's go to the next thing. God's like, that's not worship. Because look at this. Look at Exodus 20. Pulling this scripture back, but I just want you to keep seeing this. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. The part I want you to catch this is the holy piece. To where God goes, I want you to set this day apart. Make it meaningful. Make time for me. Worship, not just corporately, but individually. Take this time together and just be blown away by what I want to do in these moments. Because what I see too often is we've got Christians with a very shallow relationship with God because they don't actually Sabbath. And then they wonder, man, where's God? Where's God in all this? And God's going, I need you to get to know me. Set a part time for me. I want to pursue you. I want to have this relationship with you. But if you don't make time for me, this relationship's never going to go anywhere. Uh, there was a great quote from a rabbi explaining even more kind of this worship component to uh, Sabbathing. Unless one learns how to relish the taste of Sabbath while still in this world, unless one is initiated into the appreciation of eternal life, one will be unable to enjoy the taste of eternity in the world to come. The essence of the world to come is Sabbath eternal. And the seventh day in time is an example of eternity. 
Think how beautiful that, that sets up what God's meaning and power behind Sabbath was. He goes, I'm going to give you this day so you can get glimpses of what heaven's going to be like. But you know what makes heaven special? It's not the place, but it's the fact that you and I will be there. That's what makes heaven special, is that we get to be with the Lord. But we have too many Christians looking forward to the place, not the person who created it. And so that's why this conversation is so vital, because I've been guilty of that. I'm looking to, God, I just want the next great thing, and I want heaven, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and God's going, but do you want me? And that's where the Sabbath helps us to be able to understand. We get a little glimpse of eternity, being able to spend time with him, and it's still, we're in a fallen world, it's not going to go perfectly, but in heaven it will. And we will get to enjoy heaven in such an incredible way. So look at it this way, worship so we can connect with God. So the idea of this whole sermon hit me like a, just right in the face and gave me a perfect example of this. And it's something I set up at the beginning. But I was on a family hike. Okay, so here you go. Here's my lovely family. My wife is glowing in the background. It works out perfectly. All right. So I got all my kids on here and we're going on this hike. Lover's Leap is the hike and it's awesome. It's great. And we're, of course, having these moments where I've got kids way up ahead, and I'm having to tell Corbin, having to tell Avery, having to tell Emma and Nora, all four of them, hey, get back here, get back here, get back here. Because there came a point to where we found the beautiful spot of the hike. And I'm kind of that hiking person. If it doesn't have a scenic view, I'm out. Like, I'm like, come on, why are we doing this? Like, let's get to the top of something and see something beautiful. Like, that's me. I understand hiking's great and just good exercise, but let's go. Um, so then we got to the spot, and we got to the top, and it was sunset time. And look at this picture we got. Man, this is where we live. And I'm calling up my kids, like, kids, get up here. You got to see this. It was that awe moment. And you know what it does. When you have this moment, whether it's a picture like this or whether you're anywhere, it can just happen. You just sit there and go, I needed this. Just to be able to rest and be able to take all this in and go, God, you made this. Man, you're so good. And you can just see the joy just coming back in your heart and your mind because you just see and take in the beauty of it. So that's why Sabbath is such a vital piece. That's why he put it in the Ten Commandments because he wants you to experience moments like this on a consistent basis. So as a church, we felt like, hey, here's the thing. We don't want to just tell you this and go, hey, good luck with this. There's a couple things I want to make you aware of that I think will be very huge to being able to help you take some steps in this. One, we have 24 hours of prayer coming up. We've done these uh, two times this year, and these are moments where if you haven't been here before, you've got 30 minutes of either praying or you can read New Testament or Old Testament. You can sign up for all three if you want. But we got just our church, 24 hours in a row of people praying, reading scripture, and more importantly, just spending time with God. If you are struggling with God's pace and his speed, I would encourage you do this, because it is challenging. And every time we've done this, there have been people who went, man, I don't know if I can do 30 minutes. I don't know if I can, I can spend that long just praying, or I can spend that long, all this. And we've got cues, and we've got and scripture reading, all that kind of stuff, or reading scripture out. There's all these fears attached with it. But then they did it. They're like, it was the best time I ever had. And God's just going, because you paused, you rested, you got to experience it. And this is only 30 minutes. But I think for some of us, this is a first step. And we got to go, I need to do this. I need to be a part of it. So you can sign up through the app, sign up through the online, whatever the case may be. If you have questions, you go to the next steps or talk to me. But 24 hours of prayer is an initial step for you to maybe go, I need help Sabbathing. Here's step one. Now, the second part of it is we will have a group coming up here in the fall shortly of just being able to learn the practice of Sabbathing. There'll be uh, the group we call Practicing the Way, but just kind of diving in more. How do I do this? How do I do this well? So I encourage you, be a part of that group if you would like to do that. But those are those things. Because here's, I want you, obviously, you can start doing some of this on your own. Taking a day and going, okay, am I doing well at this? The question I want you to answer when you start practicing this is this. What is the Sabbath producing in your life? Because I hope it starts to produce those four things. Is it teaching you to stop? Is it teaching you to rest? Is it teaching you to delight? Is it teaching you to worship? So that way you could have a real and authentic relationship with God. And not only that, be sustainable. 
to where exhaustion doesn't take over, sustainability does. And too often I sit across people in our church, and some of you know this, to where I'm just looking and they're going, I am so beat up, tired, exhausted. And I go, I get it. There's seasons where that happens, but some of this is happening way too often. And some of it is happening is because we are not doing this, not Sabbathing the way we need to. And so that question hopefully should be challenging. And then this is the ultimate question. Whose speed are you following, God's or your own? Because I can tell you to do all of this, but at the core of you, you've got to have a deep desire to want the Lord. Do you want a relationship with him? Do you want to actually spend time with him? Because Sabbathing only helps you with that. If you don't, well then, yeah, don't do this. But if you do, if you want a real relationship with God, if you want him, you down deep, down in your soul, go, I want to know him. I want a real relationship with him. Then I go, go after this. So to finish our time, here's what I want us to do. We're going to have a song that speaks to that. The song's called Nothing Else, and it simply has these words, all I want is you, Jesus, and nothing else. And even, I'm sorry for the thing I've made it, sorry for what I've done with some of the time, and it's honestly just a prayer that I hope that you will kind of just listen to, but also maybe even start to sing or just say, and saying, God, my heart is to know you. Help me to start Sabbathing and to go at your pace, go at your speed, and to learn to take life just walking with you. Because that's my hope for all of us. And so as we sing this song, may it be a time where God just speaks to your soul. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you so much for who you are, and I pray that you would lead us in this moment right now. God, may you guide us, may you lead us, and God, may you challenge our hearts. Is, is it even at a place to where we truly desire you, or have we put efficiency and maximizing our life as idols ahead of you? God, may we learn to pause May we learn to resist and learn to do the things that help us have a deep relationship with you. And may this song simply be a prayer for us. May it be our heart's cry that all I want, Lord, is you. We pray all this in your name. Amen.